The 3DO Interactive Multiplayer was first released in October of 1993 and I still remember strolling into my local Babbage's and seeing it sitting on the shelf. I had read about it in the gaming magazines of the era, the new 32-bit monstrosity that would bring home photorealistic graphics like nothing you'd ever seen before. I walked over to it and saw its price tag, 700 US dollars. This bought you the system, one controller, the game crash and burn, and a couple of demo discs. I wanted one so bad, but I simply did not have that kind of cash just laying around. I decided then and there that I would set forth on a savings plan to get my very own 3DO, and so my experience began. Those early days of owning a 3DO hadn't been the best. Games in the first few months were a trickle, and the quality was all over the place. But this thing was basically the baby steps of what we were about to see with the Sony PlayStation and Sega Saturn. Polygon racing games, arcade ports that looked great, and full motion video games that absolutely crapped all over anything the Sega CD and Turbo CD had been capable of. In fact, the demo disc that came with the system was the thing I used to show the hardware off most to my friends, thanks to a few game demos and an absolutely incredible scene from Batman the Animated Series. The quality of this video in 1993 on a game console was unprecedented. My library of games started like most people's who jumped in early. All of us were privy to the awesome combat racing classic Crash and Burn. And of course I'm completely full of shit. This game absolutely sucked. The gameplay was terrible and there was nothing much going on to get you excited, but oh my god did it look great at the time. Texture mapped polygons with nearly no draw in made the roller coaster style track designs quite a beautiful thing to behold. The gameplay was like a car version of Road Rash where you had to do battle with other racers to get to the finish line. You could pick up weapons while you raced and your car showed damage as you took it. It was visually pleasing enough for you to stomach for a while but there were bigger and better things on the horizon for 3DO owners. One of my next games was Total Eclipse, a 3D shoot 'em up that looked spectacular. I mean, arcade games had begun using polygons around this time pretty frequently, and to have a game look like this in your home was astonishing. Unlike Crash and Burn, Total Eclipse actually played halfway decent too, though it was quite difficult in the later stages. Mostly it's just mindless shooting of whatever's in front of you, but there are also inside stages that need to be navigated properly. The music is absolutely epic too, mainly consisting of hard rock tracks that pair well with its fast gameplay. It's sort of a polygon version of Galaxy Force 2, and one of the early must-own games for the hardware. Another early game was Off-World Interceptor, a vehicle combat style adventure that was fast paced and easy to play. In those early days I had actually enjoyed this for a few weeks, especially since there was nothing much else to play. It was a really choppy game though, putting your eyes through hell while you played it. It very much mirrored Total Eclipse but this time on the ground. It may even have used the same engine. The 3DO was also my first experience with Alone in the Dark, the precursor to the Resident Evil style adventure game. Polygon characters against 2D backdrops were incredibly effective here, and it scared the hell out of me many a night while I was trying to beat it. It was a truly creepy game that was rather difficult to control, adding an intensity to every encounter. I can't tell you how many times I played that opening room trying to find ways to avoid the conflict within. It was amazing the different things you could do to avoid fighting. A lot of console kids first experienced this type of game with Resident Evil, while 3DO owners would get it years earlier.
It was the release of Road Rash in early 1994 that changed everything, though. It was a complete package of visual, sound, music, gameplay, and attitude that the 3DO needed. It was also one of the first games that had a direct link to the previous generation of systems, showing the massive power difference the 3DO had over its 16-bit rivals. It was essentially a motorbike racing game of combat and RPG elements. Win money and buy better bikes, forge relationships with your competitors, and beat the hell out of everyone else on the track. While the early stages were a breeze, the last level is incredibly hard and guarantees many plays before you are good enough to truly challenge it. The licensed music fit the atmosphere like a glove, and even the freaky, exaggerated art style somehow works perfectly. It's one of the best games of that year, and one of my favorite games of all time. As 1994 would wear on, the 3DO would start to see numerous releases of high-quality games. EA had really hit the nail on the head with Road Rash, but then came the need for speed. This was a tour de force of visual splendor at its release, and you could only get it on the 3DO at the time. Exotic sports cars made up the list of dream machines for you to choose, and the gameplay was a mix of arcade and just enough simulation to retain a solid fun factor. Races were of the rally variety, meaning you didn't have laps and instead went from point A to point B. There was also a mouthy AI opponent that talked trash to help motivate you to win. It was the system showpiece that made everyone that owned the hardware proud, and it was available on the 3DO nearly two years before the Saturn and PlayStation version showed up. Gex also appeared in 1994, finally giving the brand its own mascot. The wise-cracking, constantly-joking lizard came in your standard 2D platforming adventure, and the superbly colored and detailed worlds looked incredible. Animations were top-notch, and Gex's ability to climb on ceilings and walls gave the gameplay some variety beyond simply jumping on enemies' heads. Hidden areas were in each stage, and you needed to find the TV remotes to move on to new worlds. Each map was themed with a popular movie genre, and the challenge was right up there with the best of them. Once the 3DO was dead and gone, Gex moved on as a multi-platform game for the PlayStation and Saturn. Sweet, like candy. Kill your TV, man. As good as games had started to get on the 3DO, it was the port of Super Street Fighter 2 Turbo that finally set interest on fire. The hardware had come down significantly in price by this time, and while Super Street Fighter 2 Turbo on the 3DO was not arcade perfect, it was so far ahead of every other console port of the game that it felt as close as you could possibly have gotten. As gorgeous as the game was visually, it was actually the CD soundtrack that had made it really stand out. The music in this one was the best the original games ever sounded in my view, and you could easily listen to it outside of the game. The only real problem came with the system's default controller only having three buttons, meaning there was a hell of an adjustment to make to be really good. Lucky for the more adventurous among us, Capcom released its Soldier Pad, 
Hori released its own six button variant, and there was even an arcade stick available. This game is one of my best memories for the system, and my friends and I played the absolute hell out of it. Round one, fight! <laughs> The full motion video genre got a hell of a bump on the 3DO, particularly its visual presentation. The 3DO's expanded color capabilities meant that these games looked significantly better than they had on other consoles, which in turn made the genre a bit more palatable to me. I remember the first time I saw its port of Night Trap, which just blew me away at the time. It still played the same of course, but it looked so much better you couldn't help but to admire it. Dragon's Lair was a looker too, now much closer to the arcade Laserdisc version. There were a few other Sega CD staples on the 3DO, including that timeless classic Sewer Shark, which had you blasting radioactive rats while some asshole screams at you the entire time. Corpse Killer, the light gun slash not light gun shooting game with the dude that overslept at the Olympics from Seinfeld, and Star Wars Rebel Assault, a not too terrible game that had you training to be a rebel fighter and taking on the Empire. It even had its own exclusive full motion video games which were often far more adult oriented than anything Sega had allowed. Some even featured nudity and curse words. It wasn't until I played the horror themed D that my appreciation for the full motion video genre became anything more than a passing laugh. This one actually allowed you to explore and gave you puzzles to contend with and the story was light years beyond the nonsense seen in other games of its type. It set forth to be a serious thriller, and in that, it succeeded well. The 3DO also was one of the first consoles to really embrace the first person shooter genre. One of the earliest experiences I had was with Escape from Monster Manor, a Wolfenstein 3D like game that was set in a mansion full of monsters you were trying desperately to escape. This wasn't AAA stuff, but the fairly smooth gameplay did play well and the explorable environments and boss fights made for a great early experience. It even got a freaking awesome version of Wolfenstein 3D complete with a really strong technical presentation. It looked and ran as good as you could have hoped, and really did the hardware proud. It's one of the better versions of the game from that era. Unfortunately, much like the Saturn, the port of Doom to the 3DO was a tragic mess of software. While looking okay when the screen was absolutely still, it all goes to hell when you try to move around. If you thought the Saturn version was bad, this one will leave you in disbelief. Even the screen being tiny, it runs like complete ass. The poor software engineer that got the shaft on this project likely did their best, but the end result really screwed consumers out of their hard earned money. It was a completely wasted opportunity to bring this game home and making it something special. Sports games would see a big improvement on the 3DO over what we had seen on the likes of the Super Nintendo and Genesis. I was already a fan of the Madden games, and the 3DO brought out a version of that that was at the very least closer to an actual NFL broadcast. It lacked the player's license though, something that really pissed me off at the time. While it did have the official team names, it just wasn't the same dropping back for a pass as just number 8, instead of Steve Young. Luckily the playbook and AI were halfway decent, making this one a great way to experience the sport. The golf genre was bursting at the seams on the 3DO. 
EA's PGA Tour 96 was a great one, and really gave you some truly impressive environments to play in. I love the gameplay and intuitive interface here, but my god were the load times terrible. There were 5 to 10 second loading between each hit, which made a short game nearly impossible. Even soccer showed up strong with FIFA International Soccer. Now running on a 3D playfield with 2D sprites, it was a big step up visually to what came before it. It was one of the first times I was able to sit down and play a soccer game and have fun. And that's saying something considering I hated the sport as a child. As you may expect, the 3DO had some games in other regions that were worth looking at too. The 3DO had sold well in Japan and a few other Asian regions despite its crazy price tag, drawing third parties there to take advantage. This would be the first platform that I saw Police Knots on, the classic Konami adventure that was similar to Snatcher. I so very much wanted to play it despite its Japanese language barrier, and I credit it for being the starting point of my obsession to finally play it in English years later. I still bust it out every so often to watch the intro, which believe it or not, is completely in English. There's also the 2D fighter, the Eye of Typhoon. This Street Fighter knockoff features your usual suspects doing one-on-one -on -one battle until only one remains. The screen movement is choppy, and the animation leaves a bit to be desired, but it's not a terrible playing game by any means. It doesn't really look any better than a 16-bit effort, but was still nice to see something that wasn't already out on other systems. It kind of puts you in mind of an early Neo Geo fighter. I also picked up Battle Pinball, a two-player game that actually lets you and a friend play against one another. Certain scores and bonuses made it harder for the other player to keep the ball in play, such as shortening his flippers or creating distractions on the board. It was a fairly weak game visually, but didn't play so bad. It even had a Yu Yu Hakusho one-on-one -on -one fighting game. I love the cinemas that connected the fights, telling the story of your team and the enemies they faced. The arena you fought in had a sort of 3D feel to it as you fought back and forth, and it scaled in and out Samurai Showdown style as you put some distance between you and your opponent. I had a hard time with the AI in this one, never really coming to grips with how it played. Some of the later fighters just decimated me time and time again, but I still had a bit of fun with it. Of course, there are far more games in the 3DO library that I want to go over, so here are some other standouts that I really enjoyed or made a big impression on me. When the 3DO launched, the Neo Geo was still in full mythical form as an arcade platform with a cost that made it untouchable to my broke ass. So when Samurai Showdown came home to the 3DO, I picked it up instantly and played it to death. It was the arcade version at home and the type of software you brag to your friends about. Of course, more experience and time would make me realize that while it was definitely closer visually to the arcade than any other console at the time, it was still cut back in numerous places, making it not quite the perfect port I had convinced myself of years earlier. It was cut back in animation frames and the screen scrolling was pretty choppy. Even so, this is still a very playable version of this game and one I have great memories of.
I still remember when I picked up Star Control 2 for the first time. I had never played anything like it, had no clue what I was doing, and hated it with a passion. I set it aside for months and didn't touch it until one night I spent some time reading the instruction manual. It became pretty clear this was something I should have done on day one, because once you put a little effort into this one, it actually becomes a time-consuming epic that swallows your life. You need to gather resources, explore, do battle, and spend time listening to new species you come in contact with. Some will forge alliances with you, while others will simply want to destroy you. There's hours of backstory here that is truly interesting. It doesn't make things easy on you either. Be prepared to explore and be destroyed numerous times before you get your shit together enough to get deep in the game. The technical presentation here belies the wealth of gameplay within. If you like substance over style, it's a must play. The Death Sim Out of This World was released on the 3DO, now with really spiffy graphic updates over the 16-bit versions that preceded it. You know it well. You are shot across time and space to another world where nearly everything is trying to kill you. You need to run, shoot, and figure out a few puzzles to survive it all. Good game, but not for the easily flustered. The 3DO was the first place I'd play Return Fire, an overhead shooter that had you commanding different attack vehicles in a bid to capture your enemy's flag and return it to your base. The gameplay here takes some getting used to, but it looks and sounds great. The performance does get a bit choppy in areas, but the slower style gameplay rarely suffers for it. There was an expansion that was released soon after called Maps of Death, which added a ton more to do. Think of it as kind of a Desert Strike game with less story and more action. There are people that love Primal Rage, but I'm not one of them. I can tell you that the 3DO version is one of the better looking and sounding versions of its era, however. If you are a fan of this game, the 3DO take on it was quite impressive in its day.
God did I want BC racers to be good on the 3DO. I mean it was a port from much weaker hardware, so surely this thing runs at 60 frames per second, right? Well, it sure as hell doesn't, and this was a huge letdown back then. Everything else is right, the graphics are colorful, they added story cinemas, and the music is there. But it just runs so poorly the gameplay really takes a hammering. It isn't as broken as something like Doom, but definitely should be loads better than it ended up being on a $700 32-bit next-gen device. Real Pinball was an okayish game that had some decent looking boards and completely bullshit ball physics. You have to have your ball physics right or you're gonna have a bad time. This one remains notable in my 3DO history because it pissed me off one night so bad I threw the controller, which was attached to a second controller via the 3DO's daisy chain configuration. When I threw the first pad across the room, the second pad whipped behind it, smacking me in the back of the head. I destroyed them both that night with my trusty hammer o doom and they rest peacefully buried in the backyard of my old home. Seeing Starblade in the arcade back in the day was something truly special. The massive cabinet had a killer speaker set up and huge screen that really immersed you into its 3D visuals. The 3DO version here was damn near as impressive, and for an early on-rail shooter close to perfection. It was short as hell but challenging, and you had to love the super impressive graphics that gave you the option of the original flash shaded polygons or a new texture mapped mode. It's tame by today's standards, but was an evolutionary step of polygon development that showed a glimpse of the true future of gaming. It also decimated the Sega CD version, which was released around the same time. Geosword, come in Geosword, this is Team Leader. This is Team Leader. Take out the star lasers to avoid being hit. Over. Lucian's Quest was your typical old-school Japanese role-playing game by Microcabin, the guys that gave Saturn fans Mystaria. The story is rather weak in this one, concentrating on characters that don't really take things seriously, and nothing ever seems as important as your group just having fun as others suffer all around them. The battle system is strange too, taking place on an isometric playfield where trees and bushes actually need to be destroyed to reach your enemies. The scrolling is choppy as well, giving the impression that the game runs poorly. Overall it isn't terrible, and of the few role playing games on the system, pretty much your only option if you like this style of adventure. It was ported to the Japanese Sega Saturn as Sword and Sorcery. Soccer Kid is one of my most hated games on the 3DO platform. It looks no better than a Super Nintendo or Genesis game, and the stiff, unintuitive gameplay is light years behind the games that came out before it. I hate its main hero too. This always smiling, red-shirted asshole has everything under the sun trying to kill him, and the best he can muster is a soccer ball to defend himself. You might be wondering why I'm even bringing this horrible experience up if I hated it so much. A kid I had gone to school with talked it up so nice that I traded him my alone in the dark for it. Within minutes I knew he had completely screwed me over and refused to trade back. It was a fine lesson in making sure I knew what I was getting before I actually got it.
Burning Soldier was a full motion video shooter that was a bit better than most in the genre. Here you get some nice visuals that has your usual assortment of enemies to shoot, but this also has some Panzer Dragoon style lock on mechanics to spice things up. I was usually not a fan of these kinds of games, but I took to this one and enjoyed it quite a bit. It's amazing how much more appealing this style of game was once the visuals were cleared up and you could actually see what the hell you were shooting. Guardian War was a turn-based strategy game for Microcabin, and you can see the building blocks here of what would eventually become Mystaria. The 3D rendered sprites, the interface, and even the way everything moves remind you of Mystaria at every turn. Your job here is to reawaken all the guardians of the land to do battle with a new evil trying to destroy the world. As you awaken these guys, they join your team and add new abilities to your group. Instead of giving you a map to explore, you instead have an overworld that has areas that must be attacked and taken over. These areas are connected to other guardians that need to be awakened, each fight becoming bigger and more challenging as you go along. This one's ugly, but if you are a fan of long battles and deep strategy, this might be for you. Cannon Fodder was a point-and-click strategy game that has your troops doing various missions in each area. Sometimes it's just to kill everything, sometimes you destroy a base. Gameplay is super easy to get into, basically one button moving your guys and another wiping out your foes. Terrain changes affect your troops ability to survive, and later missions require you to split your teams up to take care of multiple enemies and objectives. The visuals are simple, but this is fun as hell overall. The legacy of the 3DO has been utterly lost due to its pitiful market share and a game library that would go to other systems, often with major improvements in graphics and content. This leaves the 3DO sort of in a void of nothingness, only remembered fondly by the few who actually owned and supported it at the time of its release. Those that track backwards to play the 3DO today will find games that look and run better on tons of other hardware, endearing it to no one. Pretty much every exclusive of note found its way to more powerful systems that did a much better job presenting it. And even when the 3DO does get a rare win, it's usually something like the sound. Software that was an incredible experience you couldn't get on any other console of the era, like Super Street Fighter 2 Turbo and Road Rash, are all now remembered on platforms that had much bigger installed bases. Even its own mascot is remembered by more PlayStation owners than those that played it first on the 3DO. This sad reality strips away just how awesome owning a 3DO back then was. Seeing the fifth generation of consoles start in 1993, nearly two years before the Saturn and PlayStation showed up in North America, was something I'll never forget. While the price tag kept it away from most people, it was a ride I don't regret taking. I'm SigaLordX, thank you guys for watching, and I will catch you next time.